Welcome back to our recordings of Treasure Island. Today we are on chapter 26, Israel Hands. And I hope you guys can't hear the cough next to me. I'm trying to record this at school today. The wind now hauled into the west. We could run easy from the northeast corner of the island to the mouth of the north inlet. Only, as we had no anchor and dared not beach her till the tide had flowed farther, time hung on our hands. We both sat in silence over another meal. So meaning they're kind of bored. They're sitting there with not much to do. Captain, said he at length, with that same uncomfortable smile. Here's old O'Brien. Suppose you was to heave him overboard. I ain't particular as a rule, and I don't take no blame for killing him, but I don't reckon him ornamental. Now, do you? Meaning... There's this dead man that's just lying there and they've been sitting there around this dead man for so long. He's like, can't we just throw him overboard? And even though he's saying that I don't even take any blame for killing him. It's not really the right thing, maybe. But this was a common practice that when someone died at sea, they would they would bury them at sea is what they call it. But really, it's just they couldn't tie an anchor to the body and then they throw them overboard and let them sink down to that watery grave okay i'm not strong enough and i don't like the job and there he lies for me said i so jim is saying i'm not strong enough to haul his body over the side of this boat and i'm not about to do it this here is an unlucky ship jim he went on there's a power of men been killed in this hispaniola a sight of poor men dead and gone since you and me took ship well, now, I'm no scholar, and you're a lad as can read and figure. Do you take it as a dead man is dead for good, or does he come alive again? So what do you think he's trying to do right here? He's trying to scare him, perhaps. Okay? You can kill the body, but not the spirit. You must know that already, I replied. O'Brien is in another world and may be watching us. Ah, says he. Well, appears as if killing parties was a waste of time. Howsoever, spirits don't reckon for much. But what I've seen, I'll chance it with the spirits, Jim. And now, I'll take it kind if you'd get me a, well, you get me a bottle of wine. This here brandy's too strong. So he's trying to get him to go get go get Jim to get him wine now. But he's saying that the brandy is too strong. Now, as for the notion of his preferring wine to brandy, I entirely disbelieved it. The whole story was a pretext. He wanted me to leave the deck. So old Jim is smart, isn't he? He's already kind of figuring out this scheme. But with what purpose, I could in no way imagine. His eyes kept wandering up and down with a flitting glance upon the dead O'Brien. All the time he kept smiling in the most guilty, embarrassed manner, so that a child could have told that he was bent on deception. However, I saw my advantage, and that with a fellow so stupid, I could easily conceal my suspicions. Some wine, said I, white or red, because there's two types of wine you can drink, white wine or red wine. So he's just going, Jim's going to play along with this scheme that O'Brien is coming up with. Well, I reckon it's about the blessed same to me, he replied. So it's strong and plenty of it. All right, I answered. I'll bring you port, Mr. Hands, but I'll have to dig for it. So port is a type of wine, port wine. I scuttled down the companion with all the noise I could, slipped off my shoes, ran quietly along the gallery, mounted the forecastle ladder, and popped my head out. I knew he would not expect to see me there. So who's outsmarting who? O'Brien thinks that he's tricking Jim. However, Jim is pretty smart, and He's gone as noisily as he can, making all kinds of racket as he walks. And then all of a sudden, he just quietly 
tiptoes out of his shoes, takes them off, and very quietly goes up and is like spying on him is what he's doing. Well, here's what he sees. He had risen to his hands and knees, and though his leg obviously hurt him sharply when he moved, he pulled himself across the deck at a good rate. In half a minute, he had reached a long knife, discolored it to the hilt with blood. He tried the point upon his hand and then concealing it in his jacket, trundled back again into his old place against the bulwark. Now, this was all I needed to know. Israel could move about. He was armed and I was meant to be the victim. Yet I felt sure that I could trust him in one point, And that was in the disposition of the schooner meaning he could trust him in the fact that they needed each other to get the schooner where it needed to go. We both desired to have her stranded in a sheltered place so that when the time came, she could be got off again and with as little labor and danger as might be. Until that was done, my life would certainly be spared. So he knows that O'Brien's not going to do anything to him until the Hispaniola has been secured. While I was turning the business over in my head, I had stolen back to the cabin, meaning he got back to the cabin quietly, slipped into my shoes, laid my hand on a bottle of wine, and made my reappearance on the deck. Hands lay as I had left him, all fallen together and with his eyelids lowered, as though he were too weak to bear the light. He looked, however, at my coming, knocked the neck off the bottle, and took a good swig. He lay quiet for a little and then begged for tobacco. Cut me some, says he. I haven't no knife. It'll be the last lad, for I'm for my long home. So he's trying to pretend like he's, he's about to die, so please cut me some of that tobacco. Well, said I, I'll cut you some tobacco, but if I was you, I would go to my prayers. Why, said he, tell me why. Why, I cried, you've broken your trust. You've lived in sin and lies and blood. There's a man you killed lying at your feet, and you ask me why? For God's mercy, that's why. I spoke with a little heat, thinking of the bloody dirk he had hidden in his pocket. The dirk is that knife. He took a great draught of the wine and spoke with the most unusual solemnity. For 30 years, he said, I've sailed the seas and seen good and bad. Fair weather and foul, provisions running out, knives going and whatnot. Well, I tell you, I never seen good come a goodness yet. Him as strikes first is my fancy. Dead men don't bite. Them's my views. Amen. And now look here, he added, changing his tone. We've had about enough of foolery. The tide's made good by now. You take orders, Captain Hawkins, and we'll be done with it. So he just said a lot in that. He was kind of being sarcastic because Jim told him to go to his prayers, meaning you need to pray for your soul before you die because you've been a killer and you've done all these bad things in your life and you need to pray for mercy from God. It's basically what Jim told him. However, he gets all solemn and, and serious and he says for 30 years, he's never seen good things going well. And he's saying that when you kill someone, they aren't going to come back and bite you. So if you let somebody, if you show somebody mercy and you let them go, that they could turn on you later on and come back and try to kill you. That's his views. That's what O'Brien thinks, right? So he says, well, dead men don't bite. That's why I've killed. And then, and then he ends his prayer, but it was really just kind of a sarcastic prayer to justify why he is the way he is. We had scarce two miles to run, but the navigation was delicate. The entrance to this anchorage was narrow and shoal, and so that the schooner must be nicely handled to be got in, meaning they had to maneuver around obstacles pretty much to get to where they needed to go. Hans was an excellent pilot, for we dodged in with a neatness that was a pleasure to behold. So he's, a good, he's good at steering the boat. The shores of North Inlet were as thickly wooded as those of Southern Anchorage, but the space was longer and narrower. 
and more like what in truth it was, the estuary of a river. So really they're not on the sea as much as they are where a river meets the sea. Now, said Hans, look there, there's a place for to beach a ship in, fine flat sand. So remember they have to run the ship up into where it's a nice sandy bottom. And then as the tide comes out, um, the ship won't move until the tide comes back in and lifts the boat out and then they're able because even on a river the tide still comes up and goes out so that's what he's saying he's found the perfect place to beach the ship oops Let's say. oh sorry i skipped the page guys and once beached i inquired how shall we get her off again you take a line ashore there on the other side at low water. Take a turn about one of them jib tines, bring it back, take a turn around the capstan, and lie to for the tide. Now come high water, all hands pull upon the line, and off she comes as sweet as nature. And now, boy, stand by. So he basically just explained what I did about tide coming in and out. He issued his commands, which I breathlessly obeyed. I put the helm hard up and the Hispaniola swung around rapidly and ran stem on for the low wooded shore. The excitement of these last maneuvers had interfered with the watch I had kept on the coxswain. I had quite forgot the peril hung over my head. So he's kind of forgot about the fact that um, O'Brien wants to kill him and has planned to kill him. And stood craning over the starboard bulwarks and watching the ripples spreading wide before the bows. Perhaps I heard a creak or saw his shadow moving. Perhaps it was an instinct like a cat's. But sure enough, when I looked round, there was Hans already halfway towards me with the dirk in his right hand. So he's got the knife in his hand. He's coming after him. We must both have cried out when our eyes met, but his was a roar of fury like a charging bull's. I leaped sideways, and as I did so, I let go of the tiller, which sprang sharp to seaward, so that the steering wheel of the ship. This saved my life, for it struck hands and stopped him. Before he could recover, I was out of the corner where he had me trapped. Just forward of the main mast, I stopped, drew a pistol, took a cool aim at him, and drew the trigger. The hammer fell, but there followed neither flash nor sound. The priming was useless with water. So he's just aimed this pistol at him and he's he's pulled back the so he's pulled back and cocked the, the gun and he pulled the trigger, but it never fired because it had gotten water in it. Wounded as he was, it was wonderful how fast he could move. I had no time to try my other pistol. I was sure it would be useless. I must now simply retreat before him, and he would hold me boxed in the bows. Seeing that I meant to dodge, he also paused, and a moment or two passed in faints on his part in corresponding movements upon mine. I had often played such a game at home, but never before with such a wildly beating heart as now. Still, I thought I could hold my own against the seaman with a wounded thigh. Suddenly, the Hispaniola staggered into the sand and then canted over to the port side till the deck stood at an angle of 45 degrees. So the ship has now run up onto the sand and is now tilted up to about that much, a 45 degree angle. Both of us rolled into the scuppers. The dead red cap with his arms spread tumbled after us. I was the first to foot again for hands had rolled into the dead body had to find some new way of escape this instant for my foe was almost touching me quick as thought i sprang onto the shrouds rattling up hand over hand and did not breathe till i was seated on the cross trees so he shimmied up the big pole that's in the middle of the ship where the cells come off of it i had been saved by being prompt the dirk had struck not half a foot below me and there stood israel hands with his mouth open a perfect statue of disappointment. I lost no time in changing the priming of my pistol. Then having one ready for service, I proceeded to prepare the other as well. So he's priming, he's pulling back and cocking his gun and then trying to get his second pistol. 
Hans began to see the dice going against him, so the odds are no longer in his favor. He hauled himself heavily into the shroud and with the dirk in his teeth began painfully to mount. He was a third of the way up by the time I had readied my pistols. One more step, Mr. Hand, said I, and I'll blow your brains out. Dead men don't bite, you know, I said with a chuckle. So that's Jim. He's throwing back the same words that O'Brien had told the hen. He stopped instantly. I could see by his face that he was trying to think, and the process was so slow and laborious that I laughed aloud. His face wore an expression of extreme perplexity. So he's very confused. He's perplexed and shocked. In order to speak, he had to take the dagger from his mouth. So he had been holding the knife in his mouth as he was trying to climb up to get to Jim. But in all else, he remained unmoved. Jim, says he, I'd have had you but for that there lurch. But I don't have no luck. I reckon I'll have to strike, which comes hard for a master mariner to a ship's youngster like you, Jim. I was drinking in his words, as conceited as a cock upon a wall, when back went his right hand over his shoulder, something sang like an arrow through the air. I felt a blow and then a sharp pain, and there I was pinned by the shoulder to the mast. So he's just been shot through the shoulder and stuck to that big pole. So the knife is through his shoulder and stuck to the pole. And that's Jim. Jim is now stuck. In the pain and surprise of the moment, I am sure it was without a conscious aim, both pistols went off and escaped out of my hand. He did not fall alone. With a choked cry, the coxswain plunged headfirst into the water. So Jim just shot him, not, not just with one, but with both of his pistols without even thinking about it because the pain was so much that he just shot the guns off without even aiming them and has just killed the coxswain and thrown him into the water. And this is kind of a, a scene of this happening. So you can see the knife up at the top. That's where Jim has been pinned to the, the beam. So this is that beam that goes up, okay, the mast. And that's the coxswain. So that's O'Brien falling off into the water. And then we'll pick back up in a few minutes with pieces of eight.